Good morning. Uh, my name is Dietram Scheufele. I'm a faculty member in the uh, Department of Life Sciences Communication at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and I also have the, the great pleasure of being one of the six co-organizers of what's now the fourth Sackler Colloquium on the Science of Science Communication. Um, this one is different for a variety of reasons, and I'm sure we'll talk about all of them. Um, it's, it's topically focused on misinformation about science in the public sphere. It's also the first one of the four that we've been that we've done in, in here in Irvine. Um, and for those of us from the Midwest who are still waiting for spring, uh, we particularly appreciate that. Um, I do want to make sure that um, that uh, I speak for a group of super creative um, co-organizers um, from a wide variety of, of fields, uh, both STEM uh, people who work on the ground on science communication and, and people who work on the science of science communication, which is really the original um, purpose um, behind the, the, the Sackler Colloquium on the Science of, of Science Communication, the idea that we would um, approach science communication as, as, as a problem that, that has data-driven, at least partly, um, partly answers. Um, so uh, the, 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 the group, um, I think, spent a lot of time in, in smaller groups uh, with each other on the phone thinking through um, how to structure this, and I, I think we came up with an extremely exciting lineup. Many of you, of you in the room uh, are part of this, but I did want to make sure, typically we do this at the end, I wanted to make sure that we do this at the beginning as well. Um, there are so many staff members, both within the Division of, of Behavioral Social Sciences and Education and the academies more broadly, many of whom are sitting in the back, are, are, are accommodating last minute requests for getting their slides on, including myself this morning, um, and, uh, and have been super patient, so I just wanted to make sure that we say thank you at the beginning to the staff and everything that has been done. Yes. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have plenty of opportunity to do that again um, at the end. Um, how did we get here? Um, just for those of you who may not have been to many of the, or some of the others, uh, there have been, in 2012, Ralph Cicerone, uh, the late Ralph Cicerone, who uh, had the foresight, I think, in 2012 to, to really recognize some of the ironies in, in how we do science communication and, 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 and said, look, this is one of the, science communication is one of the few areas of science where we're not being scientific where we're not relying on always the best available evidence that can guide practice, and where practice can inform the kinds of research questions that we should, we should be asking um, in psychology, in sociology, in communication, in decision sciences, uh, in behavioral economics, in a wide variety of, of disciplines. Um, there were uh, three special issues, there have been three special issues of PNAS um, that have summarized some of the work. The third one, um, it's just about to, to come out, I think, and I'm looking at David Stopak in the April back. 16th. April 16th. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of the articles are already, are already online and, and, and you can look at them, but I wanted to make sure that I, that I highlight them really quickly. The third one was a, a special, uh, kind of a, 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 an interesting transitional um, Sackler for two reasons. A, um, it, it, had, it capitalized on, on a report, on a consensus study out of, out of DBAS, um, Communicating Science Effectively, that was supported by the Rita Allen Foundation, and I know Elizabeth Christofferson is here, uh, through Climate Central, um, that summarized what we know, but maybe more importantly, what we don't know about, about um, uh, communicating science effectively as we're thinking across areas of, of controversy, um, and, and as we're extrapolating potentially from one controversy um, um, to the other. The other thing that, um, that the, uh, the third Sackler did, it, 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 it highlighted uh, two partnership awards. So these were awards that were also given in, with support from the Rita Allen Foundation, um, bringing together practitioners and researchers. Um, and we'll hear from both groups who, who won partnership awards um, at this meeting in, in different formats. Um, and, uh, and, and both Liz and Emily, I think, are going to be here and, and, and we'll talk about their work in, 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 in the small groups. Um, and, 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 and I think it was the, the first attempt to, to, to really bridge um, with funding, encouraging the bridging of these, of these two areas. Um, the last thing that I'll mention is um, because it, it came out of, at the, out of the third Sackler, is, is a standing committee on advancing uh, science communication, research and practice uh, that is housed within DBAS. 
Um, and that, that tackles a number of, of different things. I, I'm fortunate enough to co-chair that with Anne Bartuska, um, uh, uh, dealing with, with strengthening connections between a, a, a few areas that, that are not always as clearly connected or as explicitly connected or there's no incentive system to connect them. Different networks and, and initiatives that we have in the field that sometimes work in parallel but not always in unison or not always as, with as much cooperation as they could be. Um, connecting research and practice, um, not creating new things, but really connecting things that are out there, Correct, cre uh, connecting a wide variety of disciplines, um, and then maybe most importantly, connecting with audiences that we as a community, as a science communication community, haven't always done a, as good a job as we could have connecting. Um, people have different labels, and for that, uh, sometimes we talk about underserved audiences, hard to reach audiences, beyond the proverbial choir, uh, whatever that might be, but that is really a key focus of that standing committee, um, um, broadening the reach of the conversations that, that we should have and, and have to have in science communication. A uh, couple more things. One, um, you see a very diverse set of panels and, 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 uh, and, and small group discussions and, and, and foci over the next two days, um, but they all hopefully coalesce around four, four different themes. One is the idea, and, and you'll hear about this in the next panel after this one, um, the idea that very often when we talk about science communication, we're actually pushing in slightly different directions in terms of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So really being clear about what we're trying to do, ranging from having a, a, an honest bi-directional or multi-directional dialogue or, or really changing behaviors, um, and there are lots of other outcomes beyond that, but just as two examples will be crucially important. Um, I intentionally use the word, the, the verb iterating here between research and practice. It's not research informing practice. It's also practice informing research and in that hopefully in a very cyclical fashion leading to better both research and, and practice over time um, with an eye toward outcomes. That requires clear evaluation and metrics, something that we haven't always been doing as well as we could have. It's difficult to look at data and find out that what we've done may have not worked in spite of our best intentions. Um, and then ultimately the idea of how can we create sustained partnerships um, between um, the bench sciences, the social sciences, and, and, and different fields of practice uh, for, for moving forward. Um, the the SACL colloquia, of course, have been going on for a long time, and I, I do want to take just a, a, a few minutes to talk about an issue that has been on the minds of the organizers um, a lot as we're leading up to this. We're having a Many of you, hopefully all of you, are aware of, of many of the debates, societal debates that have been going on about uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical and the role they may have played and have played in, in uh, potentially promoting, as some people are arguing, um, or at least not being as open as they could have been, um, the opioid crisis, OxyContin, and other issues. Uh, this left us as the organizers in an interesting position. On the one hand, um, the Sackler Colloquia have been going on for a long time. Uh, this endowment has been created for this um, long before uh, the, the, the current crisis. But at the same time, there is also the fact that we're under the Sackler, Sackler name are having a, 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 a colloquium on misinformation. Um, and there's a, there's a, <laughs> exactly, there's a certain irony in that. Um, and so we had a lot of conversations amongst ourselves uh, and with other folks and, and, and we decided that this is uh, the forum, maybe as a result, the, the forum to move forward with those discussions, with very open and very frank discussions. Um, and also, and maybe more importantly, that this field of science communication will be crucially important. Um, and this, in this particular topic, how do we create structures, how do we use research, how do we use communities of practice to make sure that we, for any issue, including this issue, uh, we make sure that the best available scientific evidence is, is available and that we use mechanisms of science communication uh, to prevent misinformation and disinformation. So what we're hoping as organizers is that this is gonna be a starting point of a much broader discussion that will have Lots of open and frank discussions. I'm sure the issue will come up during this colloquium. And, um, and I think uh, will be a good example for many of the mechanisms that we're looking at. And I think as also as different communities um, ranging from 
the scientific communities to communities of practice, philanthropy, and the academies themselves are, are continuing these discussions um, as we move along. So I did want to make sure that we talk about this at least briefly at the, at the outset, because I think it's, a, it's a, an important theme for, for this meeting. Um, but this session is not about me. This session is actually about um, uh, two things um, uh, or, or, or two papers that for those of you who haven't downloaded the app yet, there should be another email blast going out. There is an app that you can download on your phone that has A, all the attendees, it has all the programs, but it also has links to two uh, working papers that we commissioned um, on narrative on the one hand and then on, on the landscape of mis and disinformation. Um, and my Cacciatore is, is going to be our first speaker um, who will talk to us about this. Uh, Mike is a faculty member at the Grady College of Communication at the University of Georgia. Um, and a lot of his work deals with information um, about science in the area of vaccines elsewhere. He's published widely in communication journals in Nature and, and other things. And for full disclosure, uh, uh, Mike and I have also uh, collaborated on a whole bunch of projects in the, in the, in the past and is a very good friend. So uh, it's my, my particular pleasure, uh, given that, uh, to welcome him on stage and, and give our first talk. Mike.